All right. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, we're going to get started. As you noticed, we did not have the intro video today as normal, or if you're new, maybe you didn't know. But we normally have an intro video. Today I am in um, Bear Lake, Idaho, celebrating my mom's 50th birthday. So pretty far away from the office, but I wanted to make sure I took the time to spend with you guys and um, welcome you to the newly diagnosed myeloma patients chapter. My name is Audrey Burton Bethke. For those of you who don't know me, and I'm the Myeloma Crowd Community Manager. Today's session will be recorded and it's going to be um, available to you within 48 hours of the event's conclusion. I'm grateful for your support, your attendance, your participation in the future Q&A at the end of um, Arjun's presentation. So let's get started. As always, I would like to thank our sponsors without whom this would not be possible. Uh, if you notice, we have a new sponsor um, with us who I'll mention. Bristol Myers Squibb, Amgen Oncology, Genentech, Adaptive Biotechnologies. Our newest sponsor is Sanofi, Oncopeptides, Karyopharm Therapeutics, and Takeda Oncology. And we're grateful to each of them for their support in making this possible. Today's topic is going to be discovering if you're high risk at diagnosis. Knowing what type of myeloma you have is so important because it helps us understand the myeloma and be able to target it and um, treat it better. Your first induction therapy is arguably the most important therapy that you're going to receive and what will get you hopefully into the longest remission. We want to make sure that you're attacking your myeloma the right way, which means we need to understand what kind of myeloma is really, uh, what kind of myeloma we're really fighting. Um, high risk myeloma patients often need more rigorous regimens than those with standard risk. In addition to this, researchers are working extremely hard not only to detect genetic high risk at the beginning of diagnosis or at relapse, but they are also exploring the use of precision medicine to discover what treatments are best for different types of myeloma, genetic types of myeloma. One of the biotechnological companies doing this type of research is Skyline DX, and we wanted to invite one of the representatives uh, with us today to speak more on this topic. It's my pleasure to introduce him to you. Arjun Van Manen is the EVP of Business and Commercial Development at Skyline DXBV. He is a strong commercial professional with a track record in clinical research, international marketing strategy, market access, commercial excellence er, programs, excuse me, and business development. His primary fields of expertise are oncology, hematology, and surgery. He also has experience in the pharmaceutical, medical device, and diagnostic fields. Prior to his working at Skyline DX, he worked at an organization such as Bristol Myers Squibb and Takeda Pharmaceuticals. He is fluent in Dutch, German, and English. So Arjun, the time is now yours. Thanks, Audrey. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, also congratulations to, uh, to your mom. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I hope you're having a, a good a family celebration there. Um, I'll pull up my slides. I don't know why the camera did that, but no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this should be good. Well, welcome to, to the presentation and thanks again for, for the opportunity of, um, of sharing what we did as a company and as a team so far. Um, so my presentation um, starts off with a, a bit of an introduction on multiple myeloma, where I realize that most of you probably are really well informed, um, but it sets the outline of the of the rest of the presentation. So what we really recognize, and we see that across uh, the different uh, studies that are ongoing, the work that we did is that multiple myeloma still is considered to be a rare and incurable blood cancer. Um, it originates from the plasma cells in the bone marrow and what you uh, what you would need is to have a lot of different tests done to really understand what the constitution of the disease is and what the potential beneficial treatments would be um, what was already addressed i would say by audrey as well is that there are so many different opportunities currently um, that impact positively the overall survival uh, but there's still a lot to gain 
So what the estimate newly diagnosed incidence is, or the, the number of patients that are yearly diagnosed in the U.S. is 32,000, uh, or roughly about. Um, what the remission states also demonstrate is that you go through different phases. So uh, the first onset will be clonal expansion, then to a state that's called MGUS, into early melanoma of myeloma, sorry, uh, and then uh, uh, multiple myeloma. So the test that we've developed, um, the Sky92 uh, signature, is specifically for multiple myeloma, not for the precursors. So when you're diagnosed with an active melanoma, you uh, initially would respond to the first-line treatment. And then, like Audrey stated as well, you would go into remission. Then there would potentially follow a relapse. And then in that second line, there would be um, uh, another remission going into multiple lines. And all the therapies are really um, emphasizing the need to get a deep response um, with a good quality of life, and then to extend that, that plateau of remission for as long as that is, uh, that is possible. Um, one of the um, uh, key distinctions in, um, in um, symptomatic multiple myeloma for the diagnosis is the presence of CRAP features. So the, the patients that um, go into clinic um, and ask for further investigation of, uh, of their disease, or what might be uh, ongoing or might be uh, going wrong is, is the CRAP features. So the calcium is impaired, the renal failure, anemia, bone lesions, there can be many different things that are all associated with the disease and all would lead to a potential diagnosis of multiple myeloma, but are also consequences are tied into the disease itself. So what you see, and this is a European one, um, I know the, the audience is international, so it might be a little bit different for the US specifically or other countries, but this is a, a very recent one where they're listed um, throughout the different stages. So at diagnosis, at response, at follow-up, at relapse, um, based on what then the sample is, either it's blood or urine or bone marrow or imaging, what types of analyses would be advised? So the full diagnostic workup is quite a number of things. Some are seen as obligatory because you need to get a confirmation of the disease, uh, the severity of the disease. Some might be considered optional, especially at different stages. But across the board, these are the dominant uh, diagnostic uh, works up workups that would be required. Um, I think that I can share the, the slides definitely also with uh, with Audrey. If you're interested in any of the references, they're all in the bottom of the slide, so they can already uh, be investigated online if you want to get more specific information. But what you see here is already the first instance uh, for bone marrow. So the bone marrow is seen as a as a tool to confirm the plasma cytosis and the uh through different techniques. So they, they state it's either new, next generation sequencing or next generation uh, flow, which are different methodologies to really look at the, the cells and the plasma cells. Cytogenetics is also really important, uh, where then different techniques, um, you might already uh, are really aware, aware of that fish um, that's a technique to then determine if there are certain translocations or, or certain deletions present. And those will be indicative of the uh, aggressiveness of the disease and even potentially if a patient might respond better to certain given treatments. So the bone aspirate and the biopsy is then taken for plasma cell morphology and percentage, so to see how much of the disease load is there. Uh, flow cytometry is used, which is a technique in the laboratory or FISH, which stands for Institute of Hybridization. Um, and something that's relatively new where a company then really focused their efforts for research on is genetic profiling. So can we use the bone marrow sample? Can we use the, the bone marrow cells, the, the, the plasma cells, the uh, myeloma cells, all in a different way to determine more and to get a better understanding of the disease itself? What you know from, um, from literature, what you know from clinical practice um, is that there are a lot of different potential mutations, uh, translocations. They are, are named also a little bit differently across the board. Uh, this makes it highly complex uh, to also have a really good understanding and conversation with your physician to have an informed uh, path forward on, uh, on the disease plan. But there are, generally speaking, those uh, phases where you go from a normal plasma cell to MGUS to smoldering myeloma to multiple myeloma and even uh, an advanced stage for plasma cell uh, 
uh, leukemia. Um, and what you see is that these might differ over time depending on the disease state, but the, the load, the, um, the number of those translocations would increase. And the genomic, as they're then called, abnormalities vary with the disease state. Something that makes it even more complex uh, with the uh, multiple myeloma is that if you would take a sample and you would look at the clones and you see the distribution here at diagnoses, um, and you see the constitution of clone one, which is 72%, you give a, a certain treatment, in this case, lenalidomide and dexamethasone, uh, it might influence the distribution of the different clones, but then under treatment, um, going into first relapse, one clone be can become more dominant than the other. So they all would impact how the disease is progressing. They all would impact what the response to treatment is. And that's one of the reasons why there's so many different drugs and so many different opportunities within the, the treatment landscape for multiple myeloma. Um, and you see that coming back into communication, for example, by Myeloma Crab, with the great opportunity that they provide these educationals through the chapters. Uh, but another initiative, the MMRF, uh, the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, which is, I would say, one of the, the leading research organizations in the U.S. dedicated to multiple myeloma, also state that you, as a patient, might be undergoing a lot of complex discussions, uh, evaluating with your physician different treatment options and the prognosis. And increasingly so, genomic sequencing can provide valuable information about your prognosis and how the cancer would uh, change to, uh, to respond to that treatment. Um, I think another thing that is really um, key to, uh, to have um, well communicated is there is no one standard in multiple myeloma when it comes to treatment plans. So independent physicians, clinics, uh, patient preferences all tie into rarely individualized treatment plans that um, cannot be seen as common across a, a large group of, uh, of patients. Um, so what Audrey said as well is that often if a patient is eligible and the patient is in a good condition, um, um, is fit enough to, uh, to undergo a stem cell transplantation, there are still many physicians that would choose to give an autologous stem cell transplantation, which would be preceded by induction treatment, which can be two drugs, so a doublet or a triplet combination of drugs, uh, then the autologous stem cell transplantation, followed by consolidation, and eventually a maintenance treatment. We also know that a lot of these innovative drugs, like daratumumab, elatuzumab, ex ex uh, exazomib, all relatively new, um, uh, introduced in the last couple of years, also provide opportunities not to uh, choose for autologous stem cell transplantation, but for a medicinal treatment uh, regime, which is then uh, to the discretion of, of the physician and, uh, and the patient uh, to determine what is the preferred option. And the exciting thing is that it's not just um, where we currently are, but also where we're going. There are so many new drugs and combinations still feasible. There are uh, different inhibitors, there is uh, a vaccine, there are different checkpoint inhibitors, CAR T cells is relatively new. So the landscape is offering more opportunities, but also offering another layer of complexity to seeing not only what will be the first treatment that you would consider, but also can you anticipate what the second and third line of treatment might be and what was the consequence of choosing one over, uh, over the other. Um, Again, this is an example from Europe uh, because it's a very recent one. Um, and um, this speaks, I would say, to the complexity of all the different combinations and all the different considerations uh, that a physician has when the patient is, is uh, first diagnosed with multiple myeloma. So the first assess um, assessment would be, is that patient eligible for ASCT, so autologous stem cell transplantation? And if yes, what would be the induction regime and what would be the maintenance and what would that look like? When a patient is not eligible, there are different options to consider. Um, and more so, I would say, outside of the US, that also really depends on um, the availability of the drugs, the market access, if there's reimbursement set for different treatments and it all influence the, the treatment pathway as such. Um, some are considered to be um, uh, uh, intravenous, some are oral, so there are also different attributes that play into what the preference might be for um, treatment. 
But what you would see across the board, that in that conversation, all physicians strive for personalized medicine where they can. And in the consideration of a, of a, of a, a hematologist or an oncologist that strives for personalized medicine, uh, I would say that there are three main um, aspects, and this is from one of the key European leaders from the, from the UK that presented at the uh, European Hematology Association conference, uh, the goal of personalized medicine, where he stated you should strive to maximize the outcome, um, reduce toxicities, and uh, where feasible, uh, overcome the principle of, uh, of resistance. And then there are different biomarkers, so there can be different uh, um, either a gene expression profile or, or uh, a different uh, understanding on the disease level or on the patient level, a biomarker uh, that would give you prognostic information or predictive information. Well, most of the work ongoing uh, in multiple myeloma is focused on improving the prognosis, um, and there's definitely work ongoing on the predictive side, but there's just limited positive results so far. And predictive would be, can I determine if a patient has a certain sided genetic aberration or abnormality that they will respond well to this treatment or with a 90% success rate? That currently is not yet there, but we do uh, have uh, a tremendous um, um, scientific uh, achievement, I would say, by refining the prognosis and the information on prognosis. Um, in your conversation with the physician or when you, when you investigated more information, uh, there are definitely a lot of different definitions around high-risk multiple myeloma diagnosis, and they evolved over time as well. So what you would normally see is that increasing body of evidence or more data would also give a refined image or a refined perspective from physicians or from, from, uh, from uh, clini clinical society, what can be considered to be high-risk. Uh, they look at blood markers, uh, they would combine that with the fish or the cytogenetic aberrations or abnormalities that we just discussed. They would also look at the percentage of circulating plasma cells, so not just in a bone marrow, but also um, in other places in the body. They would signify if having one cytogenetic aberration um, is giving a different interpretation than having multiple, so having two or having even having three. Um, and what's then the contribution of having a gene expression profile? And a gene expression profile, Sky92, that's what we developed for the last seven years. Um, and I'll give you more information later on. Uh, but the risk factors that are taken into account are often the age of the patient, um, how well the patient still is able to perform, so how frail the patient is. So not just the biological age, but the, the age of the, of the body, the, the condition of the patient themselves. Uh, to determine if they're fit enough to undergo a stem cell transplantation or certain uh, treatments. Um, are there comorbidities that need to be taken into account? Uh, what's the biochemical information that is there, the genetic information, and then other aspects that I think might even be more of importance than, uh, than uh, what we discussed before. What do you as a patient have of a preference? Um, how can you strive for a depth of response? What will you do when there is an early re re uh, relapse or that clonal evolution that was discussed before as well? So Sky92 is originally a result of, uh, of, a, of a discovery of research done in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam with the Erasmus Medical Center. Uh, Sky92 stands for um, the 92 genes that show a certain expression level. So if you have that expression level, if you have that information, so the 92 genes are expressed in a certain way that we will measure through microarray, which is just a, a technique to measure um, the um, genes and if they are switched on or off, and then look at the levels in which they are switched on or off. Therefore, you can have a, a prognostic value. Uh, it was demonstrated that the 92 were indicative of a patient that has a more aggressive, um, uh, prog a more progressive uh, form of the disease. So uh, they tend to have an early relapse. They tend not to respond well to treatment, um, and they have much sooner uh, a remission or uh, uh, an, an event uh, or a second line of treatment needed. 
So what we then do as a company, you do the initial research and you do again do, do uh, what we call analytical valid validity and then clinical validity. So you go through different steps of, uh, of validation. You can consider it somewhat like phase one or phase two or phase three research that you would see with pharmaceutical companies. So this is again, a very mapped out pathway, how you can come to test development before it's actually then introduced in clinical practice. Um, Sky92 therefore has followed a path to get regulatory approval in Europe, which is a CE marking. And in the US, we have a San Diego based lab uh, that offers it under CAPCLIA, which is then uh, the certification process for us to be able to, uh, to offer that in, um, in the US uh, market. Um, one of the questions that we often get is uh, 92, 92 genes is a lot of, uh, of genes. So what, what makes it that those genes are indicative as a marker? Uh, and how do they compare to the markers that we already have? Well, this is work that was published last year by a group in the UK, where they then said that um, there's value in looking at gene expression profiling and there is value in looking at uh, the cytogenetic abnormalities but they both stand for kind of a different biological principle. So one really goes into the cell cycle control, one goes in DNA response. So if you combine that, you actually have a better understanding on a molecular level, what the characterization is of the disease and therefore the sensitivity. So how accurate you are, the prognosis goes up. So the prognostic, prognostic sensitivity goes up. We are still doing a lot of research in that domain. So we're still looking at uh, individual genes, we're still looking at combination of genes because we still want to strive for a better understanding why these 92 are so indicative for uh, um, less favorable responses or less favorable disease outlook. And what we found is that there are different attributes um, until now that, that fall into the category of cell growth and proliferation. Uh, some, some would be related to DNA repair or the lack of. Uh, some will fall into cell cycle pathways, but there's still a lot of research for us to, uh, to do uh, together with academic groups to really better understand how we can tackle this and maybe direct certain treatments better. So what we need to do that analysis. So the physician would schedule the bone marrow function, the bone marrow would be collected. Um, we often require two to 10 milliliters bone marrow aspirate. It's then sent to our lab in San Diego. Um, what we then follow is a very um, uh, it's relatively complex, but it's a fully standardized sample worker process that also then entails the data analysis and a reporting of the results. Um, the plasma cell purification, so we take out the plasma cells from the bone marrow. Um, they are labeled for the RNA, and then the, um, the computer and the software analyzes the expression levels and then sees if the, if the signature, if the biomarker, if the existence of the 92 genes is there, yes or no. When we, uh, look, at the, um, when we look at the clinical validation, um, so when we, um, um, when we look at the validation of, um, of, does this perform as well in other groups? Because you do your first discovery on a certain patient population from a certain study, you want to see is that reproducible then in different studies with different treatments given with different patient characteristics. So that's what we call a clinical validation. And what you see in this table, I realize it's a lot of information, but it's uh, 16 independent different trials. When as a, where as a company, we had the opportunity to access the data, then rerun the data and the algorithm, and then see if we have the same prognostic capability in those data sets. Um, and the distinction here is that there are patients there that are newly diagnosed, so ND, uh, patients that were relapse refractory, uh, the size of the groups differ. And what we see across the board, so in almost all these studies, uh, there's about 20% that has the high risk profile for Sky92 that don't respond well enough to treatment to overcome that, that high risk uh, aspect of the disease. Um, this might be a bit technical, but the other thing that we then really do is we compare it to readily available risk markers, some that are in research settings, some that are already in clinical practice. And then we try to see if that outperforms what is currently being done. Uh, the table shows that if you look just at Sky92, or if you would compare it to ISS, which is uh, two blood markers, uh, it's a system that all hematologists would use. 
you're actually better in defining the prognosis and the prognosis then on multiple levels. So if you have Sky 92, which on the left side is the red line, um, so you do much poorly. So what you see is that the group then is split up in three groups. Um, if you're Sky 92 high risk, um, you're in the red group, so the, the bottom line, which then shows that your the disease progression is going uh, really rapidly and you're not responding well as it is a survival curve. So the curve uh, shows that it's going um, well into the phase early on of relapse uh, and, uh, and a lack of adequate response to treatment. But if you're in the green group, you actually do really well for a long period of time. Uh, we don't know what the reason therefore is. It can well be that the, the disease um, is better under control by the immune system or that the treatments are more effective uh, given by certain patients or for certain patients. But if you then have Sky 92 and you combine that with your ISS classification, you have three categories that you can, uh, can determine. So you have low risk, the intermediate risk or the, the high risk category. And then what you see in the other curves is that we also repeated the same analyses in other subsets of patients and patient data to then see if we can come up with the same prognostic value. And that was definitely the case. So you could state that with Sky 92, you are predictive of an early relapse. Um, the work done in the UK uh, then says, well, we already have a lot of information there. Uh, they call that translocations or again cytogenetic abnormalities. Um, what you see in that, that, that Venn diagram would look like a flower is that they say, well, is there not any other combination of overlapping areas that if you would combine the two, uh, you actually have a better predictive value. And what we found is that Sky 92 for gene expression profiling independently of that does provide an, another insight in who is progressing or who can be considered high risk. So with everything that they currently use in clinical practice, you don't necessarily have the full 100% of understanding who are the ones that have an aggressive course of, uh, of the disease. So uh, here they state that they found an additional 10% of high risk patients that they couldn't find with any other high risk marker. So this is a schematic um, and it's a concept, uh, but what we find is that, especially in the US where there's a good access for minimal residual disease monitoring, um, you can actually combine it too. So you can combine risk assessment early on when there's a newly diagnosis of multiple myeloma. You can use the categorization for low standard and high risk. And then when you have the benefit of also combining that with uh, minimal residual disease, you look at the aggressiveness of the disease up front, and then you combine that with a measure that would look at the response to treatment. Um, if the response is insufficient or not good enough, you can together with your physician determine if you, can, if you need to go up in treatment or if you need to go down in treatment, because if you do well for a long period of time, you might choose like the personalized medicine concept to have something that's less toxic or less, um, invasive um, and might give you as good outcomes if you would have considered otherwise. So the concept here is that as everyone has different treatment plans, um, there's a concept of de-escalating, so go down in treatment and go up in treatment escalating. Um, and to every physician or, or uh, uh, that can mean something different for every patient, that can mean something different as well. Um, escalating treatment can also be to have a double stem cell transplantation, so immediately one after the other, which is um, quite severe. Um, and de-escalating can be that you go from a triplet, so combining three drugs to two drugs. And there are just a lot of variants possible here. But as a patient, if you want to be informed and you really want to understand the aggressiveness of the disease, um, you can also have a, a consideration if you want to have a discussion about not just the treatments that are available, also the opportunities to get supportive care or even the eligibility for certain clinical trials um, that will be investigating drugs that have not been approved to the market yet, uh, but will be in the near future. So the Sky92 uh, signature, um, what we did as, as a company is we didn't want to um, promote it too early in the development process. So uh, although we have it available through our San Diego lab, 
We really wanted to work together with leading physicians across the US to then build upon the evidence so that we can also strive for Medicare reimbursement and have active engagement with commercial payers. So now already a couple of years ago, um, we worked or started to work together with these nine institutions um, where we asked them to uh, do the risk assessment like they would normally do. Um, and then in parallel, do also the sky 2 analysis. And then what they would do is they would give um, the indication of a treatment plan on the basis of their regular workup. And then they would be blinded to sky 2 They would communicate what the treatment plan is, and then they would be given the sky 2 result. And then on the basis of that result, they would ask, uh, they would be asked, would you now reconsider? Um, so if a patient was standard risk according to them and now high risk, would they, go, would they go up or would they do something different? Uh, but the other way around as well, would they go down in treatment? But this has been very recently published, so it's also in the public domain. So if you're interested, we can definitely provide the reference and the paper um, so that you can also, um, if that is of interest, discuss it with your physician. But what we found is that in quite a, a large portion of patients, it really uh, led to a, an optimized and adaptive treatment plan. So sky 2 really resulted in a renewed clinical risk assessment by the physician. Um, and what we also found um, was that the percentage for patients that were deemed to be high risk and that de-escalated was quite high. We, I, I, I think that as a team, we, we, could, we kind of underestimated upfront. We thought it would be the other way around. Uh, so more patients would be considered than high risk and go up in treatment. But the ones that are initially deemed to be high risk, 65% actually would de-escalate it to be reclassified as standard risk. Um, and then if you have the appropriate monitoring and communication tools in place, you can always adapt going uh, throughout the disease course. The 22 patient, 22% of the patients that were initially classified as standard risk were now classified as high risk based on the use of Sky 92. Um, so again, uh, in summary, um, escalation means treating more aggressively. And then de-escalation would be really to um, do something less and might even consider to do something less in respect that you also keep something in the back pocket until there's progression. Um, so not given immediately up front, but if you wanna see how the disease course goes, you communicate well between the physician and the patient you can say that this might be a consideration for second line, but you don't have to do it immediately in the first line. Um, what we also find is that there is some predictive value in Sky 92. So the publication from the UK, um, United Kingdom stated that what they found was that the patients that were Sky 92 high risk um, did not derive statistical benefit from lenalidolide maintenance. So now, now the patients that are given um, uh, after stem cell transportation maintenance treatment are often given lenalidomide as a single agent maintenance, and they stated that that's just not enough because it's not overcoming the high-risk profile. So it doesn't mean that you should not do something more and give, for example, two treatments or don't give anything at all. They just state that if you see that a patient is kind of too high risk, you should not go with a maintenance because it, does the, the, it just doesn't do enough to, uh, to justify the use in that application. Um, this has been one of the reasons for the Australian physicians uh, to actually adapt their clinical guidelines, and it's now incorporated in their clinical guidelines. The other uh, aspect that, that we see across the board, which is really exciting, is that there's still a lot of opportunities there for high risk. So although all our retrospective data that we analyze doesn't give a preference from one treatment over the other, there's still a lot of exciting new opportunities coming out, which we are really hopeful uh, and anticipating that they might provide additional benefit to, uh, to have a better disease outlook than uh, that, that we, we now see for the ones that are Sky 92. Um, so multiple myeloma, in, in conclusion, is a very heterogeneous disease. Uh, we see that it varies uh, between patients. It varies also over time. Um, and it really comes down to the patient and to the physician to see what needs to be done with this information and what can be done with that information. Um, we have Sky 92, it's now available in the US. Um, as we're working diligently, now the publication is out to obtain coverage. 
there is no coverage yet. Um, we are working on our file uh, to submit to Medicare, which means that Medicare would take um, quite some months for the dossier to be reviewed and to, uh, to uh, evaluate if the data is now sufficient enough, but we're, we're currently in an, very active in submitting that. And we also want to engage with third-party insurers to, uh, to see what the opportunities are. Uh, we already initiated some conversations with Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, but these can be lengthy processes um, and, and, and does take time. Um, and they do ask really good due diligence on the data to assure that when they do take it on policy, that the appropriate studies will justify a clinical adoption and uh, an application. Um, we started very recently with uh, adding colleagues to the team in the US. So Steve is uh, my latest colleague in the US who has taken on the mission to further um, make the test available and to see where we can work together with institutions uh, to see how we can uh, can really bring it to clinical pra to clinical practice and to to patients. Uh, these are his contact details. Uh, feel free to to reach out. Um, and if you have any kind of request related to the presentation, um, any request when it comes to the, the references provided or the studies, please let Steve know or through Audrey, and we're more than happy to provide that. We also have a clinical and scientific affairs team, uh, so they're more medically um, educated, so they can definitely also give you some, uh, some background if that's appreciated. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you. I'm so happy to have you here. This is the second time that he's presented to one of our Milo McCrowd community chapters. So thank you. It was just as good, if not better, the second time. <laughs> um, it's now time for questions. We would love to hear your questions. If you enter them at the bottom of the screen, there should be a little Q&A icon and you're welcome to ask your questions there. Um, as we wait for, there already are a couple, but I'd like to jump in and start with mine, <laughs> if you don't mind. Tell me more about this Medicare uh, connection and will people participate? Well, I guess my question is, if we get more people participating in these studies, will that accelerate um, approval or, or national use of this, of this test? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, our engagement currently has been with a specific uh, Medicare Administrative Council. Um, what it would look for for a molecular diagnostic, and they do it for all molecular diagnostics, is they would follow a path of validation, meaning that, and it's really good that they do this, so they look at, is it is it sound methodology, so can we speak to the quality of the laboratory, the way that it's executed, do they have the right processes in place, do they have the right staffing in place, um, which is then part of the analytical and the clinical validation. Um, and that's something that's, I would say, considered a little bit more technical, but they really do a due diligence on that, which I think is, is really good. Uh, but then the third element to that would be the clinical utility. And the clinical utility um, in their review is really related to the fact if you have a molecular diagnostics, it would provide you an outcome. And does that outcome impact the patient pathway? If it does, that means that the physician or the patient need to decide that something will be done differently on the basis of that outcome of the diagnostic test. Can you then also correlate that with improved outcomes? Those improved outcomes are not defined because they can be overall survival, but they can also be patient satisfaction. Uh, I think the main thing that they strive for is that when this is used or when this is endorsed by them, that it's used appropriately for the right patients with the right purpose. And I think that's definitely the role that they take. Um, what we found, and, and uh, Jenny has been uh, a great um, uh, partner in those discussions with us, how can we make it come across eloquently enough for them to understand that there is a utility in patients being better informed? And that is not as easy as it would look like for multi-myeloma to signify one treatment, because that would be the best thing, right? You use Sky92 then you have to have this treatment over the other. Uh, 
I've been active in a lot of different oncological diseases, and I think it, it would do it fair to say that multiple myeloma is definitely one of the most complex ones, especially when it comes to the treatments and all the options that you have. Uh, so for us to give that communication to uh, a company or uh, a representative from Medicare that sees a lot of different diseases might not be as educated in multiple myeloma, is not maybe as educated in the treatment landscape, um, that, that can be a challenging process. So to your point, so where can patient advocacy help? I think in conveying that message and seeing also how we can work together to make sure that peers understand that there is a true value, despite the fact that you cannot specify a specific treatment over the other. That's a perfect answer. Thank you. In addition to that, that kind of goes with my other question. You know, as you were saying, myeloma is so unique to each individual. It's so complex. It's one of the more um, more complex cancers and, and chronic diseases that are out there. But I guess I would ask you, with all the different treatments, I mean, it's wonderful that they have so many treatments compared to 15 years ago or 10 years ago, let alone 50 years ago, the progress that has been made is absolutely amazing. But now that they have all of these options to choose from, it's almost the other end of the stick that it's complicated and hard to know, especially if you're just seeing your local oncologist instead of a specialist, well, which of these many options do I take? How do you see this Sky 92 test helping this problem or easing this, this problem of so many options, not sure what to decide? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of speaking on another one's behalf, I think, but, but, it, but from our discussions then with Jenny, she really says that she has so much to consider when it comes to her personal situation, her family life. Um, so she wants to understand when she had that diagnosis, what is my outlook? Uh, do I have the good variant and I might live long for a certain period of time with treatments that I know have publications out that would give me a good indication of how well they would perform for me specifically? Um, or do I have the bad variant and do I need to have a different consideration because I might need to see if I'm applicable for CAR T cell treatment uh, because if it feels like that's the way I want to go and I fully understand the risk and potential benefits that are tied into that. Um, yeah. My first reaction would be, it, and I'm, I'm definitely sure not everyone would agree, uh, but to have the full understanding of the elements of the disease that you can investigate and that you can understand tied to a certain extent into the decisions uh, that you're willing to make. Um, and also maybe to see how compliant you might be with staying in a clinical trial, which is very intense, or undergoing a certain treatments where you would have moments where you feel that you might not have made the right choice, but it was the best alternative, uh, right? So it can be a motivating aspect, but um, yeah. No, thank uh, you. I didn't mean to put you on the spot with that question either. I just think that, um, especially with the prognostic medicine that's that we hope to see in the future, um, that, that the research is being done to try to ease that question, I guess, or, or try to help people find solutions. Yeah, there's um, quite a few questions from the audience. So let's get started with those. Erica asks, how much tumor burden is applicable for Sky 92? For example, M spike 0.1 above or 0.5 above or more, or yeah. is it another lab indicator? Yeah, really good question. So uh, um, uh, first instance is the patient needs to be confirmed multiple myeloma. So there are different ways of confirming multiple myeloma, but then you already reach a threshold for the tumor burden. So it's about 10% and, and above. Um, and then we would say that you're eligible for then the analysis to be done. Um, we do need good quality bone marrow sample. Um, which is a weird thing to say if there would be differences, but um, the thing is, if you if you're 
treated or if you're in an academic center, they might use the same sample for different things. And, and uh, that means that the sample might be prioritized for internal research because you can send it to different research uh, opportunities. And then we end up with the last bit of the sample and that might not always succeed. So this is definitely something that we then discuss and communicate with the physician as well. Um, we give guidance on how you can get the best sample and provide the, the best communication. Um, but when we then get it into the lab, it goes through different steps of quality control. Um, so we need to have two milliliters of bone marrow at a minimum. And then the first uh, check would be, are there enough cells in there to be able to perform that analysis? If that's not the case, you would get an immediate, immediate communication that is unfortunate, but we're not able to derive enough cells to be able to perform that analysis. If they are, we we'll go through the full workflow. And then by the end of, let's say, day five, you will be able to get that information or the physician. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, can a patient be high risk in fish, but lower risk in Sky 92? What we know from the analyses that we did, yes. Um, yes. <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> This is a really good question. Um, that it's possible because um, um, I don't want to overcomplicate it, but the the <laughs> risk goes into definitions and um, how you define risk, risk for progression. And what they know from literature, what they know from studies is that if there is a presence of a certain fish marker, so a uh, cytogenetic aberration, that there might be a less, uh, a more unfavorable outlook. Uh, but we also know that fish is done by every hospital. It's not necessarily standardized. So there could be some discrepancies if one hospital does it over the other. And we also know that not everyone for the full 100% that has a certain cytogenetic aberration does as poorly as you would think. Uh, so there's still a discriminative power within the group of fish cytogenetic aberrations presence. So if a patient gets the communication uh, that uh, uh, he or she has uh, a deletion 17P um, and another translocation, um, that's definitely a piece of the information. They are definitely correcting what they say. But if you also have SCAN 2 done, that would give a better clarity if that actually then is the line that's going rapidly down and has a bad prognosis or the one that looks more favorable. Uh, so one is not mutually exclusive of, uh, of the other. Um, and it's kind of like what I showed with the Venn diagram, so the circles on top of one another. One shows a bit of the image, one shows the other. If you combine the two, you have the best understanding. Great, thank you. Um, well, the biopsy, done last September be applicable to do Sky 92? Um, does it have to be a fresh sample? Well, yeah, this is interesting because this depends if they biobanked the sample. So in theory, it would be possible if the sample is stored in a certain way, we would still be able to do it. Um, we do need fresh bone marrow if we would do it today because you need to be treatment naive. Uh, or not actively on treatment because you might not have enough myeloma cells then to be able to perform the analyses. Uh, but if the institution did, um, uh, if they did, um, and they, they often do, if they do some sort of biobank with the material, we can definitely investigate if it's an option. I was muted. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> um... So uh, we have a couple of patients wondering, you know, what uh, in, makes them ineligible for a Sky 92 analysis? For example, um, if they're on Dara and Revlimid, you know, what kind of things make them, are there certain treatments or certain procedures or certain time after the stem cell transplant? When, yeah. when is somebody eligible or non-eligible due to treatment? Yeah. When they're doing well, they're not eligible, um, uh, which, uh, which should be a, a good thing. Uh, uh, but now it means that we need to have enough myeloma cells to do the investigation. So if there really is a minimal residual disease, so if the disease is under control really well, 
um, there might not be enough cells there to do an appropriate analysis. Um, so what we say is a patient needs to be either treatment naive, so has gone off treatment, but you also should already have a spike of, uh, of, of the disease. So either you're in the phase of relapse, so the disease has returned, or refractory because you don't respond well enough anymore to treatment, so it's, it's already coming back, or you're newly diagnosed. So if you're on the treatment and you're doing well, that's absolutely great. If you then are relapsing and you would like to understand in that second or third line of treatment, um, if there has been a change and you might, because it's an early relapse or you might have a consideration that there, there might be a concern that you now have an aggressive form and therefore you wanna make a different consideration for treatment plan or have that conversation with the physician, then you will be eligible. Great. And then we have a, a couple other questions about the cost. Um, let's say Medicare doesn't cover it. What is the cost for workup? Um, yeah, the, yeah, the cost uh, that we're submitting to, uh, to Medicare is 4,000 US dollars. So would the patients be responsible for that if they wanted a Sky 92 test? Uh, well, we're currently working on a patient assistance program, uh, but like I said, said before, um, we're really early stages, so we're yes. trying to uh, do this really rapidly, and our ambition is also to then um, approach myeloma crowd to give their, to, uh, to request their opinion about it, because it is relatively new to us as an as a organization, um, to see if they deem it um, acceptable for us to uh, implement it. And right. then in the background, we're really working on first um, engaging with the principal investigators. So the, the, the investigators from that promise trial, because what we found is they went through that learning curve. So they mm -hmm. went through the study, but they also know what is the additional value? How do you select the patients? How do you take the samples? So if it's Arkansas or if it's Hackensack, those are institutions that already have really good experience with it. Um, and now that we come to a point that the last patient will be included in the trial, we're also asking them the question, can we collaborate on a maybe more localized level to keep the access to uh, patients to be able to, uh, to um, get it prescribed, um, which could be by engaging with the local dominant uh, third-party payer, assurer, um, or to find another opportunity because they have innovation funding. So right. we're, we're trying to be creative, uh, but but we're not there yet. That's okay. You're in the very early stages, but we're excited to be a part of it. We're excited to be a part of this initial yeah. part. And I think it's a good question maybe too for Steve, um, who is that U.S. representative? Yeah. You know, if they exactly. Want We'll, we'll include Steve's contact information in the follow-up email along with the slides and this recording. And that way you can reach out to um, Steve with your questions about you know cost and how to get it to your local office. We have a different question here, kind of a follow-up to that, but let's say they're scheduled for that bone marrow biopsy. They say, okay, well, I want to do this Sky 92 test. Yeah. Does anything need to change to, to enable the Sky 92 test, or, or can it be done at the same time as this bone marrow biopsy? Um, yeah, for us, it would be key to engage uh, immediately with the um, uh, physician um, or to, to set up that contact for the logistics um, so that we can also be sure that they understand what the sample requirements are, how can we get it to our lab in San Diego, practical things like how do you FedEx it over to the lab uh, and then to provide them with a kit. So the kit is, um, uh, because it goes into a tube, the kit has, uh, what's it called? The bubble wrap in uh, to mm -hmm. keep it stable. It's, it's all those practical things, mm -hmm. uh, but they're also be sure on how to communicate the result back uh, when will you receive it? Do you have any questions about the procedure? So we really want to educate the physician as well. So if they're not familiar with it yet, because we didn't do the broad communication, that we provide them with the adequate papers and references that they can also read up on it. Mm -hmm. And that they can also be, um, yeah, not necessarily the educator, but, but at least the conversational partner to the patient right. to make sure that they interpret the results together. Okay, awesome. Um, 
we have a, a couple questions that I'll, I'll try to take a stab at, but you're welcome to help me. <laughs> um, this patient said they were diagnosed with stage two multiple myeloma lambda light chain. Transplant resulted in stringent complete re response or remission, which is incredible. Does this remove me from being high risk for relapse? The, unfortunately, the answer is no. <laughs> and you, I wish it was yes, and I want it to be yes. But the amazing thing is, Arjun and I were kind of talking about earlier, is myeloma is so unique and so, I'll say weird, that it can come back with a different genetic profile than you had initially. So the answer could be yes. The answer could be you come with a different, less high risk genetic profile in your myeloma when you relapse, but it's not guaranteed. And there's not a one answer fits all or a one size fits all answer. And um, I'm happy. I'm really happy that you have achieved stringent complete response. I hope you stay there for a long, long time. Um, and then once you notice your numbers jumping up, uh, let's be proactive and uh, talk to a myeloma specialist about treatment. That's, that's my biggest recommendation there. I don't know if you have anything to add, Arjun. No, I think it's great that that the the person is uh, in a strange and complete remission. I think that's great news. Um, and let's assume it stays like that if it doesn't, uh, because the yeah the the way data comes out and the way that every conference new data is appearing. Um, also offers the opportunity that your conversation might be very different in six months than that mm -hmm. you had like a year and a half ago. Exactly. Um, so not just the risk assessment, but also take into consideration that um, treatments for myeloma in six months can be very different due to new understanding of the disease or the treatment itself. And probably will be, right? Probably I think so too. Be. Yeah. Right. So so it's, it's so don't see it as a yeah. Um, I hope you stay there, but but take it as a as not a single opportunity to be educated, mm -hmm. uh, but try to keep informed and see what is the development so that when the relapse does occur, uh, you don't have to get all the information in at, at once, but then, yeah, moderate it, I would say, almost over time so that you really understand what are these new treatments, where they're going to, if you have more questions, uh, that you also have the opportunity to investigate a little bit more because I think it's more, um, uh, how to put it, it might be better to do it now that you're in a remission, uh, in a remission state than when you're confronted with a relapse. Yeah. Uh, then it can be a lot of information at the same time. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. I've noticed a couple um, of people who've been asking questions have been really concerned about the stage that they were diagnosed with. And I think that's another unique part about myeloma. Um, some multiple myeloma specialists don't even use staging anymore. Staging in myeloma is a lot different than in solid tumor cancers. Um, and I just want you to be aware of that. And, and on Health Tree University, there are classes that can educate us a little bit more on why staging and why and when staging is used and important in myeloma and when it's not. I would argue um, from the education and research that I've done um, with specialists is it's what's more important is kind of what we're talking about here, high risk versus standard risk, um, because that's gonna affect your myeloma journey a lot more than what stage you are at diagnosis. I know that sounds funny because in the cancer world, we're used to staging affecting the prognosis of the of the um, disease, but anyway, I just wanted to shine that little bit of education um, about staging being unique in myeloma and perhaps not as important. Not not that it's not important, and I'm not trying to discredit anyone who's who's scared at that stage three point, but um, just be aware that it's not the same as it is in other solid tumor cancers. I'd like to end with this one question. Um, someone from the UK, sees Martin Kaiser, who has also been involved in some of this research. Are there moves to bring Sky 92 assessment to Europe in UK? 
So I thought that would be a good uh, question for that, you to finish on. Yeah, that's a big yes. <laughs> well, that that is a complete different presentation and also a lengthy uh, trajectory. But we're working really close with Martin Kaiser um, and the uh, and the Royal Marston uh, because they are really keen on implementing this where they believe that it provides additional insights in a disease state that is already very complex um, and they're very keen of, uh, of incorporating it in their uh, routine arsenal of, uh, of diagnosis and diagnostic workup. Um, and that might not be through Steve, but uh, through Audrey, I'm more than happy to provide more information. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we're excited for that. We're excited to see this across the globe for all myeloma patients um, and their families. It's also relieving to their families, I think, as well. We'll finish off with a couple of announcements, but thank you so much, Arjun, for joining us today. Um, I've really appreciated your presentation, and I'm excited to continue to work with you as, as we go on. Um, our next uh, myeloma chapter meeting uh, for the nine, oh my goodness, can't talk. <laughs> Our next newly diagnosed myeloma patients chapter meeting will be on August 19th, 2021. I'm really excited about this one. It's understanding your labs. We're having medical professionals come talk to us. What do those lab numbers even mean? What numbers are important to pay attention to? When should you be concerned? Um, when should you be excited? <laughs> uh, so we're gonna be, um, doing that together on August 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern to finally understand what our lab indicators mean and which ones we should be paying attention to. We're running low on time, so I won't go through all of these. I did want to just mention July 28th is an exciting day in the Myeloma Crowd community. We're having three events that day. First is our Selenix or support group chapter, learning about the Carry Forward financial and emotional support program. 3 p.m. Eastern is a connect with the myeloma crowd chapter where uh, that's for international patients who use Health3 Cure Hub, which features are the most beneficial, beneficial for them and which ones perhaps are not so beneficial um, because they're US based. At 7 p.m. Eastern is our nutrition for wellness chapter. We have Dr. Robert Osfeld. He is a Forks Over Knives author, which is a nationally renowned uh, organization for nutrition and plant-based eating. He's coming to speak to us. This is a huge deal. Dr. Osfeld is really a celebrity in the world of nutrition. We're really excited to see him. So even if they're not a part of the Myeloma Crowd community, invite your friends, invite your family, come learn from one of the top experts um, how to have a healthy heart, but also how to have a healthy lifestyle. So again, that's at 7 p.m. Eastern on the 28th. And on the 29th, our African-American chapter is also focusing on fitness and nutrition. The link to sign up for any of those events um, and even more events I haven't mentioned today is found at the bottom of the slide and will be sent out in our follow-up email. Another thank you to our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, Amgen Oncology, the lawn mowers right outside, so you might hear that. <laughs> um, Amgen Oncology, Genentech, Adaptive Biotechnologies, Sanofi, Oncopeptides, Caria Farm Therapeutics, and Decada Oncology. And thank you to each of you for helping us build this strong myeloma crowd community. I couldn't do it without you. And I truly appreciate um, being connected with you through this program. So we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. <laughs>